for each and every one of us. It is well with our souls. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto our God and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The am that I am. The one that was, the one that is, and the one that is to come. The God of yesterday, the God of today, and the God of tomorrow. We praise you, O Lord, in this place. Give God a praise. Lift up your voices and praise Him this morning for He is good and His mercy endures forever. We need to praise the Lord of hosts with every breath that is inside of us, with every breath in our lungs, for greater is His faithfulness. He is the God of our salvation. He is great and mighty to be praised. Lift up your hands all over this place. Father, you deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. We worship you in this place this morning. We worship you for you are mighty. We lay down our how everything that we have lifted up, every soul that we have lifted up to an idol, Lord, everything that we have lifted up, we lay it down this morning at the feet of Jesus. We lay it down. Everything we've lifted up, we lay it down. We lay it down, we lay it down because you deserve all the glory. Not us, Lord, but you. All the glory, all the honor. You deserve it. You deserve it. like you God there's no one else like you father we pray that you would establish yourself in our hearts this morning Lord that you would that you would overwhelm us that you would overtake us Lord that you would show us your ways everlasting from everlasting to everlasting Lord we pray that you would do what only you could do 
people. There is no one else like you. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We worship you. King Jesus, we worship you, Lord. We worship you. We worship you. Lord, we want to pour out our love at your feet this morning. Lord, we want to cry out with our hearts this morning. Lord, from our innermost being, each and every one of us, Lord, we just want to decree and sing, Lord, that we love you, Lord. We love you. We love you, Lord. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. Jesus, I love you. I love you. I love you. More than anything. love on you this morning. We pour out our oil at your feet, Lord. We pour out our oil at your feet, Lord, everything we have. We pour it out for we are so grateful for you, Lord. We're grateful. We're grateful. We thank you, Lord, for the power of your spirit that is in this place this morning. Lord, we pray that through all that we do, that you would be glorified, that you would be magnified. Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would release your ministering angels to minister in this place this morning. That they minister in spirit and in truth, Lord. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, Julie. Uh, What can we say? Welcome back to Julie. She's back from Canada and America. Welcome back. Amen. Amen. It's so good to have you all with us this morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You guys can take your seats. Tanya, why don't you come up? Tanya's got a prophetic word for us, and then we'll jump straight in. The kids can go off to the Sunday school. Bless you. Good morning, everyone. So nice to see you on this cold um, Sunday morning, but I see the weather is already looking better next week, so we can put smiles on our faces, and um, it's going to be an awesome service today. And the other morning I woke up and... You know, don't we all want to enter into our promised land? What is a promised land? A promised land is that place where you feel like you know you need to go to. It's that upper level place of the vision that you carry for yourself or your family. And we all want to enter the promised land. But I heard the Spirit of the Lord saying this, that in order for us to enter into your promised land, you must listen and you must obey the instruction of the Lord. 
And I was so reminded about Moses. And you know that Moses in the Bible, I mean, for 40 years, you know, the Israelites was in the desert and they came to this place called Kadesh. And all of a sudden, the Israelites are moaning and complaining and there's no water. Can you just imagine you are in this desert with Moses and the people are complaining. And, you know, God says to Moses, speak to the rock. And what does he do? Because out of anger, He's so angry at the people complaining around him that he disobeyed the instruction of the Lord that he's saying, speak to the rock. But instead of speaking to the rock, he was striking. He struck the rock twice. Yes, the water came out. But do you know that it cost Moses to enter into the promised land, into the very place that he was looking forward to go? He could only view the promised land from, from afar. And it's just so sad to me. I was also reminded about Adam. Adam also received the instruction of the Lord. You know, do not eat of the fruit of this tree that is in the middle of the, of the garden. Do not eat of it or you will die. What did they do? They disobeyed God. And you know what? It cost even you and me sitting here today. We feel it today. Jesus had to come because an instruction of the Lord was disobeyed. I was also reminded about Jonah in the Bible. He's another great example of an instruction not obey. I mean, God said to him, go to Nineveh and go and say to the people, repent, you know, um, because otherwise God is going to destroy your city. So Jonah disregarded the instruction of the Lord. Why? Because he did not like the Ninevites. They were the Israelites' enemies, and Jonah did not share God's heart for them. So Jonah got mad at God, and he, he even got onto the ship. And you, you know what? Because he disobeyed the instruction of the Lord, even being on that ship, there was a storm that came, and everybody on that ship was affected because of the instruction disobeyed. But they knew, the sailors knew something was not right. So they cast him into the sea. They threw him out because they knew that he was the person that disobeyed the instruction of the Lord. And then lastly, I was reminded about Saul in the Bible. You see, Samuel the prophet gave Saul a message from God to destroy the Amalekites and to not keep anything of even whatever they, they, they conquered and they brought in. Nothing should they keep. And what did Saul do? He disobeyed the very instruction of the Lord. He did not kill the king. He killed everybody else. But he thought, no, let me, let me keep the king aside. I mean, that is not too bad. And what did it cost him? It cost him that all the Israelites fell dead. And then also Saul's army along with his sons were killed. Because of Saul's disobedience, he no longer had the protection of the Lord over it. And God rejected Saul. And today I want to ask you, can you hear the voice of the Lord? You see, to hear the voice of the Lord doesn't make you a prophet. It makes you a son and a daughter of the most living God. And we are all called to hear the voice of the Lord. Do you know the instruction of the Lord over your life? Do you know when God is saying to you, stop, you cannot enter or turn left or to the right? Because the Bible says that we are able to hear the voice and we need to hear and to heed to the instruction instruction of the Lord. 1 Samuel 15 verse 22 to 23 says, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the voice of the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice and to heed better than the fat of rams. May you go into this week and may you go and ask God, what is the instruction of this week? Where do you need to obey? What do you need to lay down? Where do you need to stop? And let us all be obedient in the instruction that we can all enter into our promised land, into the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Amen. Thank you. That was a good word. Amen. Amen. Talk about prophetic instruction. It's exactly what we're doing today. Amen. Can we stand up? as we read God's word, amen. 
Those of you who have your Bibles, you can open them up to the book of Zechariah, chapter 1. I'm going to start reading from verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And the surveyor's line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. The nation of Israel had been destroyed. They've just come out of Babylonian captivity, 70 years of captivity. Verse 17, again proclaim, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, my city shall again spread out through prosperity. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and I will again choose Jerusalem. Then I raised my eyes and looked and there were four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? So he answered me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. In another version it says carpenters or blacksmiths. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah so that no one could lift his head. But the craftsmen are coming to terrify them, to cast out the horns of the nations that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah and scattered it. Amen, you can take your seats. You know, in the past season, I really felt that the enemy had it out for us and the enemy's really been coming to bring a scattering, to bring a devouring and to get us to walk with our heads down, to put so much on your shoulders. I was even reminded of when you're yoked with something, there's a weight. When you're yoked with something, what happens to your head? Have you noticed when you've seen the olden days where there was a cow that was yoked, that was pulling a wagon? Did that a cow ever walk around like this? Was it pulling that wagon with its head held high? No. They walk with their heads down towards the ground because of the weight of the thing that they are pulling, the weight that is on their backs. And I really felt that the enemy's really been out to come and discourage God's people specifically because we're moving into a new season, we're moving into the, the new Hebrew New Year, we're at the head of the year at the moment and October 2nd is Rosh Hashanah and it's the beginning of the Hebrew year 5785. Did you know that if you add the numbers five plus seven plus eight plus five, what does that give you? 25 or five square and we're in 2025 on the Gregorian calendar the number 25 in the Bible symbolizes or means grace upon grace God is releasing grace over God's people this morning but a double portion of it not just a little but a double portion of grace. God is releasing grace in this season. Grace for us to turn back to Him. Grace for us to live in purity. Grace for us to bring our lives into alignment, to live in sanctification and holiness. And that means that we have to align ourselves with what God is doing because God is on the move, amen? We have an opportunity in this season, according to Zechariah 1, to build and to rebuild things in our lives. He speaks of the vision and he speaks of seeing four horns. Then I raised my eyes and I looked and there were four horns. Horns in the Bible represent power. Not just power, but aggressive power, an aggressive force, power without restraint, without resistance. It's a power that doesn't let up. It seems to push you from all sides. It's like that potato that we preached about last week. You feel like the world is surrounding you and there is no way out. That is the power of the horns that we are speaking about. If you think of a bull, a, a, a cow or a, or a buck in the, in, in the bush felt. They've got horns, right? And when they fight one another, or, or think of a, a, a deer or a, what else is there, a kudu or an impala that fights with their horns. Think of a ram, a goat, because that's probably a really good example. You've, have you ever been around a goat? They tend to like to come and headbutt you. Why? Because their power is in their head, right? Their power is in their horns. Have you ever seen a goat fighting with the hooves? Anyone? 
Have you ever seen a, 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 an impala run up to you and give you a judo kick? No. They use their horns. They fight with their horns because their horns are where their power is. You don't see a cow going running around biting everything. No, a bull, it, it hits the other bull with its horns. A ram uses its horns because its strength is located in its horns. It's in its horns where it has the most power. We are supposed to use the power that we have. God has given each and every one of us power in certain areas of our lives, and He expects us to use those areas. So many of us don't even use the power that we have been given. It says in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 3 to 5, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty. For the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We have been given power and authority, each and every one of us, to do great and mighty things through the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God that lives inside each and every one of us that believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. In John 14, verse 12, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I have done, the works that I will do, he will do also. And the greater works that these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, if we ask anything in the name of Jesus, he says, I will do it. If you ask anything in his name, we have power and authority to shift things in every area of our lives. We need to stop saying yes to the doctor's reports. We need to stop saying yes to every word that is spoken over us. We need to stop coming into alignment with the words that we speak over our very own lives. Because what happens when we speak negatively? What happens when we open up our doors because of anxiety, because of fear, because of what else gives it? Um, lies, guilt, these sort of things in our lives. What happens is we open the door to them and we allow the enemy to come in and we start giving them power. If there's one word over your life, I don't know if you guys noticed that the hope to afford defer just happened to fly off during worship in the name of Jesus. We thank you, the Lord, for his angels that are already breaking down walls in this place. But what I wanna say to you this morning is, if I come into agreement with a lie, one little lie, that's a white lie. It's nothing, it's, I just twist it up. Didn't tell the whole truth. You do that once. What happens the next time? It becomes easier. What happens the time after that? It becomes easier. And so we go. And so those lies, suddenly you start living a life of that is a lie. Because you have to catch up and then you have to remember what you've lied about because you've lied about it. You don't have to, you have to continually think. And sooner or later you'll be caught out. But the problem is that those lies to become, because you're feeding that thing, it becomes stronger. You start giving it strength. Each and every one of these things that are represented here today, as you read them, you can see in certain areas of your life, if you feed that thing, it will grow. The more that you feed fear, the more fear will grow. The more that you feed anxiety, the more anxiety you will have. The more that you are jealous of one person or jealous of something, suddenly you find you'll be jealous of all sorts of things and things are creeping into your mind and things are coming out of your mouth and you start speaking things, you start nurse cursing or rehearsing things, you start giving these things power in every area of your life. And you know what you start to do? You start to build an altar. You begin to build an altar to those things that give them power. Power, God has given us power and authority to break things down, to trample on the enemy's head. But we don't. A lot of times in areas of our lives, instead of using God's power and breaking things down, we use the enemy's power and we start to build up altars of the demonic, altars that, that do not serve God in our lives. And we start to see the fruit thereof in certain areas of our lives. God has given us power to break certain things, to overthrow the powers of darkness in this present age. 
Everything happens in the spirit before it manifests in the natural. A lot of times we think about things or we say something and then sooner, a little bit down the line, that thing actually becomes something in the flesh because we've spoken into existence in the spirit. What do these horns do? They scatter. These horns come up to destroy him. The enemy is on assignment, ladies and gentlemen, to scatter everything in our lives. He wants to scatter your family. He wants to scatter your finances. He wants to scatter your business. He wants to scatter your success and every part of your life. He wants to divide families and churches and bring division into every area. Why? It gives it to us. So he said, these are the horns that scatter Judah so that no one could lift up their head. If your head's down facing to the ground, you can't see the future. If your head's down facing to the ground, you can't see what God has for you. You are overwhelmed by your situation and your circumstance. You are overwhelmed by looking at your feet and that's all you can see. When you look at your feet, all you see is you. What I'm going through. That's all I'm worried about because my head has been pushed to the ground and all I'm worried about is me, myself, and I. So many people, discouragement and disappointment, the enemy uses that so that you will not look up through adversity, through pressures, through intimidation. The enemy wants to take away your vision. He wants you to give up and he wants you to, to stop you from advancing. I can't, have you noticed the guys, when you guys watch the Olympics, those runners, do they run with their head facing the ground? No, they look forward because they know where the finish line is. I will run, my, run the race that has been set out before me and we need to keep our eyes out. We need to be able to see where we are going. The enemy wants you to turn your head down, away from your future, away from your hope. When you're discouraged and you have the world on your shoulders, you walk around like this with a weight upon you, with a yoke upon you. You're not looking out for better places and better days. The enemy wants you to focus and be consumed on where you are today and where you were yesterday. Everyone walked on a beach before? While I was preparing, I was reminded that if, you, if you're looking down on the beach, there's no footprints in front of you. But your footprints are where your feet tread. And your footprints are behind you. And you see, when the enemy gets your head down, he wants you to be focused on where you are and focused on where you were, not focused on where you're going. Because if he can keep your head down, you will not see the future and the hope that he has for you. The enemy rises up and he comes with a spirit of scattering. He, and his intention is to scatter God's people, to make everyone feel that they need to be for themselves and that the whole world is against them. When you're looking down, all you see is yourself. All you see is your own problems, your own shortcomings, your own failures and your own mistakes. The enemy does not want you to look up and see the future that God has for you. Some of you have been living with your head down for far too long. You've been discouraged. You've faced all sorts of adversity. The enemy's sent a scattering spirit and division, and you may even feel like you have nothing left. Maybe you feel like you can't even stand up. Maybe you feel like that this morning, that you can't even lift up your head. All you see is problems. All you see is discouragement. All you see is negativity, and there is no hope. All you see is a wall of failure, the pressures of your past and the pressures of your current situation. When you look up, maybe that's all you see. When you look up, maybe that's all you see. You see the jealousy, the hope deferred, the lies, the guilt, the lust, the addiction, the anger, the torment, the unforgiveness, the depression, the anxiety, and the fear. Maybe when you look up and that is all that you can see, the enemy is trying to keep your head down. 
But you know what? I have come this morning not to discourage you, but to encourage you. Because the Lord says that we need to lift up. Can you lift up your hands right there where you are? It says in Psalm 121, 124, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. We need to look up in this season from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He will keep you. He will not he keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep in the mighty name of Jesus. Give God a praise. It's time for you and I to break out. It's time for our families to get some fresh vision. It's time for your business to align with the plans and the purposes that God has in store for each and every one of you. Lift up your eyes and lift up your head and look up. Psalm 24 and verse seven. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, so that the King of glory can come in. If I'm looking at the floor, I can't see the door. I need to see the door because behind the door, he says, I stand at the door and knock. And if you open the door, if I, I can't open the door if I can't see the handle. Aaron's so big now. You guys know our little son Aaron, he can reach the handles. So now suddenly all the doors need to be locked because he can reach the handles. But he's got to stretch. He's got to, he's got to get on his tippy toes. He's got to lift up his head. He's got to fix his eyes on that thing. And he's like, this is the prize and I'm going to get it. And he stretches out his hand and he grabs that handle and he opens the door. And then as he opens the door, the door flings open. He looks around. He's like, Who's gonna, who saw me? Who saw me? Okay, I'm going. And through he goes and he starts doing whatever he wants to do. If he can get outside, that's where he wants to be. God wants to bring you outside, out of your place of captivity to a place of freedom. God wants to deliver each and every one of you where you have felt hard pressed, where that scattering spirit has come into your life to bring oppression and depression and all these things unto you. God is saying to you this morning that I'm going to deliver you to a wide open space. I'm going to take you to a place flowing with milk and honey. I will lead you beside green pastures. I will lay you down behind, beside the still waters in the name of Jesus, open up the door, lift up your eyes, your help cometh from the Lord in Jesus' name. When Jesus steps in, when you've opened that door and Jesus steps in, I don't care how scattered or divided your family is, Jesus is your North Star. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. He goes before you, and you have a hope and a future with him. Lift up your heads, lift up your eyes, and you may see the light of your salvation. He is your strength, he is your confidence, and he will set you upon a rock. No matter what comes against you as a believer, you have access. Psalm 27 verse 1, the Lord is the light of my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid when the wicked come against me to eat my flesh? My enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise up against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, will behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He shall hide me in His pavilion, in His secret place of His tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And I want you to see this, what it says in verse six. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Everyone say, Lord, I'm lifting up my head. Say it with me. Lord, I'm lifting up my head. Again, Lord, I'm lifting up my head in Jesus' name. Amen. Stop looking down and start looking up. Stop looking at your current situation and your current circumstance. Stop focusing on where you were Stop nurse curse and rehearsing where you were and what happened to you. Stop focusing on the past and lift up your head. God has given you a hope and a future. I can hear people saying, if you only knew what I've been through, if you only knew where I've come from, 
If you only know where I've walked. In Afrikaans, they say, yes, I get grondprat geloop. I've walked gravel roads, you know, in my life. You don't know the things that I've been through. If you only knew. I can't get past what I walked through. I can't get past what happened to me. I can't get past. If you could only lift up your head and you could see where God is taking you, maybe you'd stop focusing on where you've been. If you lift up your eyes, God will show you where you're going. By God's grace and God's help, you can lift up your head again in faith. When you focus on where you have been, that's where you'll stay. If I keep focusing on what I, where I've been and what I've gone through, that's where I'll stay. What you focus on will develop. I think of those cameras. What you focus on will develop. If you focus on the past, you focus on the negatives, you focus on the negative things that you've been through, that is what will develop in your life. All the negative aspects and attributes we face on a daily basis, if you focus them, if you focus on them, you give them power. If you focus on them, you build them up. Whatever it may be, if I'm fearful all the time, I start to give that thing power. I start to give it strength. If I know that I'm tormented and I do nothing about it, if I know that the enemy's out and, and he's speaking to me all the time and I'm hearing his voice and I do nothing about it, I start to give that thing strength. If I feed lust, I start to give that thing strength. If I feed addiction, the more I do it, the more addicted I become. I start to give that thing more and more strength. I start to build that up. Unforgiveness in my heart, the lies we spoke about, hope deferred. If I'm jealous of people and I keep speaking about jealous, about things, if I keep going towards anger and I feed anger and every time that I'm angry, I don't, instead of suppressing it, I, I I just feed it. I just let it go and I'm like, you just carry on like nothing happened. Instead of saying, but hold on, hold on. Take a step back, realize that the things that I am feeding are actually not good because what the problem is, is the more power you give it, the stronger it becomes. The more power you give it, the stronger it will become. And these negative aspects of our lives, these things that the enemy throw at us, these spirits that the enemy can even put on you. You know that there's a spirit of jealousy that can come upon you. The enemy, we open up the door and we allow the enemy to come in and he will assign certain things into certain areas of your life so that you will start to feed those things. You give them strength and it becomes like an invisible barrier in the spirit that the enemy uses to block you and to stop you. When we operate in, in these things, whether willingly or unwillingly, we're empowering them. We're giving them power. You're building an altar in that area. Every time you lie, it gets stronger. The altar gets stronger. You feed it, it'll grow. It says in Hosea 4 and verse 6 that my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And I'm here this morning in the name of Jesus to impart a divine revelation through the power of the Holy Spirit of the living God to each and every one of you. Knowledge and wisdom to break you out. You have the opportunity this morning to break some things and you have the opportunity this morning to start rebuilding some things. What you have built in the past season, I decree every negative thing that you have built in the past season, you are gonna start breaking those things down. Thank you, Jesus, because Jesus died for us sinners. He died for us, those that are oppressed and afflicted by these things. That is what He died for. He gives each and every one of us a way out. And He's giving you a divine solution this morning. As we read the vision from Zechariah, it says in verse 21, and I said, what are these coming to do? So he said, these are the horns have, that have come to scatter Judah so that no one could lift up their head, but, isn't but great? But God, but Jesus, but the craftsmen are coming to terrify them to cast out the horns of the nation that lifted up their horn against the land of Judah to scatter it. There is a greater force in this vision that is starting to raise up. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And I see a group of people. There is an army rising up. 
And they're not afraid to get their hands dirty. They have, they have taken up the tools that they need. They've taken up a hammer. They've taken up a nail. You know when you have those carpentry belts, you've got the hammer here and the tape measure and the snails on this side, and it looks like you're going to work, right? I think we should all be walking around like that. Isn't it something about a man? Like if you've got a tape on your belt, hey, but I'm going to work now. Eh? Like with a pencil in the ear. It's like, no, no, I've got this. Now, now I'm going to work. Jace, you know what I'm talking about. You put a tape on, eh? If you've got your toolbox in hand, if you've got a hammer in your hand, you're going to work. They are blacksmiths and they are carpenters. They are craftsmen and they are coming. The word said that they will destroy those four horns. They are coming to break down and they are coming to build up. The Lord is raising up a carpentry people, a craftsman people in this hour and in this day. He is raising you up and He is equipping you for such a time as this. The carpenters will subdue the scattering spirit. If I subdue something, it means I take away its power. There is about to be a building and a rebuilding, which the enemy, wherever the enemy has come to scatter and divide, it's time to stop procrastinating and start building up a righteous altar unto the Lord. But if we need to build up a righteous altar unto the Lord, we might first have to break down some of the negative things in our life. We might have to take these things head on, like a carpenter or a craftsman. Take your hammer and say, I will not lie anymore. Why? Because I choose not to. Oh, but you know, my father lied a lot and he was a compulsive liar. And you know, I just can't help it because he just lied. So I'm just, gonna, you know, I can't get out of it. Rubbish, man. You have a choice. You know, that's the saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. It might not, but you choose where it lands. Because an apple can roll very far away from that tree. A bird could come and pick up the apple and plant it in another place in Jesus' name. You do not have to be where the Lord has, where the enemy has put you or predetermined through your generation and your bloodline. You do not have to stay there. Just because those altars were built up in the previous generation does not mean that you have to service the same thing. If I service the addiction, my dad was an alcoholic. I chose not to be. I don't service the altar. What happens to the altar? It loses its power. It loses its power. And as we deal with these things in our lives, addiction, depression, hope deferred, anger, anxiety, jealousy, torment, fear, as we deal with them in our lives, we remove the power that the enemy has in the mighty name of Jesus. It's time to starve some things in our lives, to strip them of their power. If you don't water it, it won't grow. It's quite simple. You know that's that saying, the grass is always greener on the other side? No, the grass is greener where you water it. And maybe that person on the other side is actually watering their grass. They're not feeding the demonic altars in their lives, but they're feeding a righteous altar. They're feeding something that, that gives power and authority and You see, what happens is, if you suffocate those things, they can't breathe. They dry up, they wither. As you do, you will start to break out of the walls of resistance that the enemy has placed in front of you. You will start to break out of the control of the scattering spirit. You will break it down. Everyone say, I'm breaking out. Say it again, I'm breaking out. Say it again, I'm breaking out. In Jesus' name. God is looking for carpenters and builders in this season because once you have broken down the walls, once you have dealt with those negative patterns and negative cycles in your life, once you have overthrown the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, you remove the blockages, you remove the hindrances that stop you from experiencing the fullness of what God has for you. It's time to work on some things. It's time for us to get our hands dirty. It's time for us to work and start worrying. Stop worrying and start working. There's a difference because a lot of us get so worried about things that we don't do anything about it because the worry cripples you and the worry pushes your head down. It's time for us to lift up our eyes.
It's time for us to stop pointing fingers and start picking up a hammer. But you know, it's because of them. Well, why didn't it happen to them? It's time for us to stop pointing fingers and pick up our hammers and start doing something about it. You can point fingers at your problems or you can pick up a hammer and go to work, putting in some effort, making changes, start being the change in your life in the name of Jesus. Maybe you need to stop say, start saying, I'm not living that life anymore. I'm not going down that road anymore. I'm not servicing that altar anymore. It's not who I wanna be. It's not who I am. It's time for you to stand up. You know that we serve the greatest carpenter of all time. Jesus was a carpenter. He was a carpenter's son. And you and I have the spirit of the carpenter that lives on the inside of each and every one of us. The walls of Jerusalem that Nehemiah built were built in 52 days. 52 days. You know that God can do quick turnarounds in each and every one of your lives. God can turn things around in 24 hours. But it didn't happen with empty hands. It says in Nehemiah 4 and verse 17, those who built on the wall and those who carried burdens loaded themselves so that with one hand they worked at construction and with the other they held a weapon. They said, I will fight for my family, I will fight for my marriage, I will fight every evil spirit that has come to scatter and divide and there are some keys. We can fight and we can build. You can do both. The enemy walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. You need to watch him because he's out to get you but you can still build. And God has given us some stones, some building blocks that we can rebuild with this morning. There's a few keys that we can use as a foundation to build a godly altar unto the Lord. Some of you this morning need to start fixing your altar. Some of you need to start building your altar or rebuilding your altar. The Bible says that the kingdom of God suffers violence and the violent take it by force. It's time for us to get violent. It's time for us to build and to war at the same time. If you fix your altar, you'll fix your life. If you fix your altar, you'll fix your life. Let me say that one more time. If you fix your altar, you will fix your life. It's sometimes when you're only, it's only when you're desperate enough to get to the point to rebuild your altar, to rebuild your altar, to rebuild your life. Maybe some of you this morning need to rebuild your business. Maybe you need to rebuild your family. Maybe you need to rebuild your future. Maybe you need to rebuild your children. When Elijah wanted fire to fall over the nation, I want you to remember something. There was three and a half years of drought. There was no dew, no rain. That means there's no water, right? I want you to see something. He went to Mount Carmel and he went to build an altar. To solve the problem, he built an altar. Any of you facing any problems this morning? Maybe you need to build an altar to solve the problem. 1 Kings 18 and verse 30, then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. So that the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones and I want you to, how many, how many boxes were there? Did anybody notice? There were 12. There's 12 boxes standing here this morning. Then with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seas of seed. And he put the wood, on the, he put the wood in order, cut the bull into pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Then he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And then he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So that the water ran all around the altar and it filled the trench with water. I want you to remember three and a half years of drought means there was no water. The one thing that they didn't have, the thing that will help you to build your altar is the thing you don't have enough of. The thing that will help you to build your altar is the thing that you do not have enough of. Most people don't pray. They don't pray when they have what they need. I wanna tell you that building an altar unto the Lord is gonna cost you something. The one thing, can you imagine? There's no rain, there's no water for three and a half years and I'll tell you to come throw all the water that you can find 
over the altar and it's seeping into the ground. God needs your sacrifice. God needs your sacrifice. And then what happened? I mean, fire fell from heaven and the nation was blessed and restored because they listened to the instruction in obedience. So how do you build your altar? Let me just find the right one. Okay. This wall's gonna look so much better by the time I'm done. Can I get some help? Can somebody come up and just help me put these boxes up? I'm looking for prayer specifically first. We'll find it. We're gonna get to the fasting. There we go. There we go. I wanna put this one at the bottom because this is a foundation. We need to build a foundation, right? Taz, that's a foundation. Uh, I wanna put fasting at the bottom because it's a foundation. See, we're building a wall. It takes some time and I gotta get my hands dirty and it's a bit of effort and breaking out in a sweatshirt in Jesus' name. But I want you to notice that all the bad things, you put worship down as foundation. And service is a foundation. So put service in the middle there, put it right there. Okay, you just pop all the rest of them on because they are, no wait, purity over there. You put the rest of the ones on top because that fruit that come with the rest of it. So how do you build your altar? Just quickly, I'm running out of time. Number one, we use the word. Ephesians 6 and verse 17 says, and take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We use the word. We start to decree the word. We start to say that in the name of Jesus, I am gonna build with one hand and the other I am going to fight. You can build and you can battle in the season. Isaiah 54 and verse 17 says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper and every tongue that rises up against me in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and their righteousness is for me, says the Lord. We decree Isaiah 7, 7, thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. Maybe that's what you need to decree on some of those negative cycles in your life in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Laura, for my beautiful display. It looks so much better than the other side, amen. We use the word of the living God as a sword and we fight the demonic altars into submission according to the word of God. Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. And in it is a discerner through the thoughts and the intent of the heart. The enemy came to build a demonic altar in each and every one of your lives. But in the name of Jesus, we have come this morning with the spirit of the carpenter and we're gonna break down every demonic altar that we have built up and we are gonna build a righteous, godly altar unto the Lord in every area of our lives. So number one, the Word. Read your Bible. It's as simple as I can say it. I watched a little clip on Instagram just yesterday. Uh, it was one of these, one of these great men of God. I, I, can't, I can't remember the guy's name. But he, he's 90 something years old. And he said, if you could speak to your 18 year old self, what would you say? And he said, I've got degrees, I've got diplomas, I've got doctrines in theology. And if I could speak to my 18 year old self, I would say to him, forget about the degrees, forget about the doctrines, forget about the theology and read your Bible. He said he would tell himself to read his Bible because we need to know the Word of God. We need to know the Word of God and we use it as a weapon in the season. Number two, prayer. We need to pray our way out. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16 says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for it is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Prayer is a basis for a righteous altar. When you pray, you don't only shift things in the natural, but you shift things in the spirit. Matthew 16 and 19, And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What does that mean? 
It means when I pray, I shift things in the name of Jesus. Things shift when you pray. They shift in the spirit. When you pray, it manifests in the spirit before it manifests in the natural. So you might not see it straight away, but if you continue to pray, you continue to press in, sooner or later, that thing that you are praying for will begin to manifest itself in the natural. You have the power to shift things on the earth in the name of Jesus. Stop being a victim and shift things in the spirit. We have the spirit of the carpenter on our inside and we have strength to lift up our heads. Pray until it shifts. Pray until it breaks. Pray without ceasing. Pray, pray, pray. Pray in tongues. You 20 and 25. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. What happens when you pray in the Holy Spirit? You build yourself up. We need to build ourselves up. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. How do you look? With your eyes. You can't see if you're looking at the ground. When you pray, you begin to shift things. You will start to see changes even on your inside. You won't want to do those things you used to do anymore. You will start to despise those things you used to love. You'll start to despise sin. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to prevent you, to present you faultless before the presence of the glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. His power is never ending. His power does not run out. You have access to that very same power. Prayer and fasting go together. Some of you have been dealing with some things in your life that have been too strong for you. You know, so many of us, we pray and we pray and we pray and we pray and nothing happens. We pray and we do everything that we know how to do, but nothing happens because there is an altar that has been maintained. There's an altar that's been serviced, maybe even through your generational and family line that you can't break out of and you're facing these things and you can't seem to get out. But just as the story we read in Matthew 17 and 14, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they can't cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation. Who's he speaking to? He's speaking to his disciples. And he's telling them they're faithless and they're perverse. How long, shall, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why, why couldn't we cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to the mountain, move, move from there and it shall move and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this is what I want you to see. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Sometimes you need to pray and fast together to break down sermon. Eh? You need, I'm getting to that. Sometimes we need to pray and fast together. When you're facing giants in your life, when you're facing horns that have come against you, these high level principalities and powers are not, not dealt with by prayer alone. However, this kind does not go out except through prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting is the key to overthrow demonic altars. 
and the overpower and they bring delays to your destiny. Those walls that you were facing, sometimes you can't just kick them down. Sometimes you need to pray and fast. We need to get into a habit of fasting. Not just fasting when we're instructed to fast. Not just fasting in the beginning of the year like we do every year. We need to create a culture of fasting, a habit of fasting. We need to fast weekly. We need to fast once a week at least. We need to fast often because it is an instruction. Fasting and prayer go together. These kinds do not go out except through prayer and fasting. Amen? Number three, purity. Repentance is the key to holiness. Repentance is the key to holiness. 1 Peter 1 and 15. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct because it is written, be holy for I am holy. Our obedience to the Lord commands God's blessing. Hebrews 12 and 14. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one We'll see the Lord. We need to live a life of holiness. Amen. Covenant and commitment builds a heads of protection around you and your family. That's why tithing is so important. The Bible says that I rebuke the devourer for your sake. Jude 1 and verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. We need to build and rebuild, but build and rebuild on the right foundation. You know, so many people say, you know, we just need to rebuild because God's grace is enough and His peace is enough and His kindness is enough. His mercy endures forever. Yes, that's all true. But to build a righteous altar unto the Lord, you need to build it on the right foundation. The right foundation is fasting, it's prayer, it's your tithes, it's worship, it's service, it's holiness, it's purity. Those are the foundation stones on which everything else in your life needs to be built. 